I'm Craig Lawless. I'm Kevin Garcia King. And this is Sounds Like Infrastructure. Before the Golden Gate Bridge was built, the only reasonably quick way of getting from San Francisco to Marin County was by ferry. And people had toyed with the idea of building a bridge to allow cars to cross the strait, but nothing had ever made it past the ideas phase. Joseph Strauss decided he wanted to change that. It was his brainchild. It was his, uh, he wanted to uh, build that bridge. There was only one problem. Uh, he didn't have any experience in building bridges of that scale. That's Henry Petrosky, Professor Emeritus of Civil Engineering at Duke University, and also an author. And he told us that Strauss... He was uh, really a builder of very modest bridges that would span canals, and they were generally considered uh, very functional. Not There was no attempt at aesthetics. And they tended to be what are called bascule bridges or bridges that uh, their, their roadway moves up to allow boats to pass and then goes down to let the traffic cross the canal. And although Strauss didn't have much experience with bridges of this scale, he did have one particularly useful skill. He was very good at convincing people to believe in his ideas. He uh, was, a very, was a salesman, I guess. And uh, he um, got to travel around uh, the Bay Area, uh, Marin County in particular, to win support for his idea that he'd build a bridge across that. And what that meant was basically uh, getting their support, financial support, really, to back bonds. He wasn't asking them for money directly, but he was asking them to back bonds that he had the authority to, to issue. Strauss rode a wave of popular support for the bridge. But he did have his critics. The ferry company alone made almost 2,000 appeals against the construction of the bridge. But in the end, Strauss won out. Now he just had to make good on his promise. Today, the Golden Gate is one of the most visited and recognizable places in the US. On this episode of Sounds Like Infrastructure, we go beyond the iconic image of the bridge and ask, how did they actually build it? We talked to one of Ferrobial's most experienced bridge builders to find out how a suspension bridge actually works, how construction workers battled with the elements of the San Francisco Bay, and how Strauss used pioneering safety and construction methods to pull it all off. That's next. The bridge that we see today is not the bridge that Strauss originally designed. Remember, he hadn't much experience on big projects like this, and because of that, he decided to play it safe, to make sure it was something he could actually pull off. At the time, uh, in the early 20th century, there were two kinds of bridges that were candidates for spanning oh, roughly the mile between the uh, Marin County and uh, San Francisco. Those bridges were the suspension bridge and the cantilever bridge, a bridge that you build out from opposite sides and join in the middle. But for this project in particular, the cantilever had a weakness. The longest span that that could reach was uh, 1,800 feet. Which wouldn't be enough to span the 6,400 feet of the Golden Gate. So his idea was to uh, build these cantilevers out as far as he could, given the technology, and then suspend a cable from uh, the ends of each of them and hang a suspension span from that. So it was a hybrid suspension bridge, cantilever bridge. Which in theory sounds good. And it's not unusual to mix bridge designs. But when the initial design was published in the San Francisco Chronicle, people did not like the look of it. Everybody who saw it knew it was not the kind of thing they wanted to put in that setting. It looked big and clunky, like one of those old metal railway bridges you see in the movies. Not something that would fit in with the surroundings of the San Francisco Bay. So Strauss assembled a team of engineers to see what could be done to improve on his idea. This board of engineers uh, didn't much care for his design, so they persuaded him to make it into a true suspension bridge. And he accepted that because uh, he realized, well, Adam, his name would be associated with it. It'd be the longest suspension bridge in the world. It would be 4,200 feet between the towers. Strauss had originally designed his bridge as a mix of a cantilever and suspension bridge because he was worried a suspension bridge alone couldn't reliably span the gap. But by the time the bridge was actually ready to be built, technology had advanced enough to make a suspension bridge feasible, which meant, after 11 years, construction could finally begin. 
When you build a suspension bridge, things have to be built in a very specific order. The first things you need to build are the towers and their foundations. Because the span length was set at 4,200 feet, the towers would have to be built that far apart. And the engineers would have to adapt to the landscape, not the other way around. They started work on the Marin County side, because the tower there was the easier of the two to build. The southern tower, on the other hand, was over a thousand feet from the shoreline, and would have to be built in water up to a hundred feet deep. To build the foundations here, they would need some special techniques. First of all, they have to prepare the, the foundation itself. They have to remove the, the upper layers uh, of, the, of the seabed just to, to reach the, the bedrock. That's Luis Martín Terezo, who's been building bridges with Ferrovial for over 20 years now. And he guided us through some of the key construction details of the Golden Gate Bridge, including that first step of preparing the foundations, which was particularly unusual on this project. For that preparation, they have to work with divers that have to place at this depth the explosive and they do it with steel tubes from the surface, but the divers have to, to place in the position the tubes and connect this explosive to make the explosion, of course, with the divers out of the water at that time. Decompression chambers were kept nearby in case the divers began suffering something known as the bends, basically a symptom where air bubbles are released into the bloodstream if you surface too quickly. With the divers having prepared the bedrock, the engineers then lowered a steel structure into the water to build something called a fender, which would protect the base of the bridge if, for example, a boat was to collide with it in the fog. This uh, steel structure works as a skeleton of the concrete wall and also includes the formwork to limit the, the concrete. And then you pour the concrete below the water. This, uh, marine technique for creating this wall. For the foundation of the pier, the workers filled the bottom portion of the fender with concrete and then pumped out the water so they could finish off the foundation in dry conditions. Just like the foundations, another key structural element of the Golden Gate is also hidden from view. And it's the part of the design that secures the cables on each side of the bay. They're called anchorages and usually found just below or near the abutments the part of the bridge that meets the land. Every bridge has an abutment, but not every bridge has an anchorage like the one found on the Golden Gate. In the Golden Gate Bridge, it's much more complex than in all the suspension bridges because below the abutment, we have to place a huge block of concrete just to anchor the main cables that are pulling uh, these anchors. The idea is to counter the pulling force of the cables by securing them to a massive block of concrete. But with so much tension pulling on the block, concrete alone would crack. And if it cracks and breaks, the cable loses its anchorage, and the whole bridge collapses. So engineers like Luis have a solution for this. Steel reinforcements. Steel uh, elements, a uh, steel structure uh, that are completely embedded inside the concrete blocks. Uh, just to transfer these pulling forces from surface to all the parts of this block. If not, if, if we don't have this kind of internal skeleton for these blocks, the concrete will crack for sure close to the surface. When the anchorages were ready, the team began work on the cables that would hold up the road deck. And there's actually a small cross section of one of these cables in the park just beside the Golden Gate. As you make your way over to it, you begin to realize how big these cables really are just over three feet in diameter per cable. And what the cross section of cable in the park shows you is that the cable isn't one big chunk of steel. It's actually thousands of smaller wires, 27,527 smaller wires that they have to spin together on site. And there's a reason for that. The uh, assembled cable, the full cable that we see now in place would be simply too heavy to lift up. Uh, so it, it has to be spun in place. Uh, so they take a wire across, they go over the uh, one of the, well, they start at one end, which is called an anchorage. They anchor one end of the wire there. Then they take it up over one of the one of the towers, and go then down up to the other tower and then down into another anchorage. So it's a, and that's the, you see the shape of that roughly in the, in the final uh, uh, bridge. That, that method was uh, developed in the, uh, 
Oh, about the mid 1800s by uh, John Roebling. He's the designer of the Brooklyn Bridge. After six months of work, they finally had the 80,000 miles of wire they needed brought from one anchorage to the next. Then once the cables are in place and finished uh, with all the wires assembled, you want to compress the wires and make it into a tight bundle. Uh, that's called wrapping the, the cables. And there are machines to do that uh, also. Uh, that's a very important procedure because if, uh, if the cables are not tightly wound uh, so that water can't get in them, in, in between them, the, the corrosion can take place. And that's occurred on some bridges. And uh, it presents a real problem because replacing the cables is not trivial. This maintenance problem is one of the reasons we don't see that many new suspension bridges popping up around the world. Technology has advanced and bigger gaps can be spanned with another type of bridge. A type of bridge that Ferrovial has built on quite a few occasions. There's the Nipigon in Canada or Bridge Over the Earth in Ireland. And it's a type of bridge that's often confused with a suspension bridge because it also has cables. This bridge is called the Cable State Bridge and you've definitely seen one of them. They're everywhere. On a cable stay bridge, we don't have a main cable. We have many inclined cables that go from the pylon, from the tower, to the deck directly. The deck is where the road is, and the cables usually go from there at an angle towards the main tower, a feature that helps you differentiate between a suspension bridge and a cable stay bridge. Suspension bridges are incredibly good options when you need to span huge gaps, like at the Golden Gate. But cable state bridges are catching up. Today, the current record is almost the same as we have now in the Golden Gate uh, Bridge. That bridge is in Vladivostok in Russia. And one of the reasons they might choose this design is, as we mentioned already, down to maintenance. In case, for example, you have to replace some cables, there's no problem. You can replace one by one, but if you have problems for corruption, for example, in the main cables of a uh, suspension bridge, then it's going to be a very, very, very difficult problem that uh, could lead to replace the whole bridge because there's no way to solve it. And that's one of the problems with the suspension bridge. That, that happened, for example, in 5th of 4th in, in, in Scotland, where they have to uh, put a, an additional one, a new one, cable stay bridge uh, in parallel because the suspension bridge that had that problem in the cables uh, has no, so, no solution, no, no way to solve it. A cable state bridge is also more rigid, which means it's less likely to be affected by wind. And in the 1930s, they were just beginning to realize how big an effect the wind could actually have on a suspension bridge. Here in America, there were quite a few suspension bridges being built at that time. And uh, at the time of the Golden Gate, from 37 to about 40, many of them uh, were misbehaving. It turned out that the wind was uh, causing them to move excessively, uh, more, than, more than expected. Some of them had to be shut down on occasion. The most famous of these misbehaving bridges was the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington, a huge bridge spanning the Tacoma Narrows Strait. That's right. It was the third longest suspension bridge in the world when it failed in 1940. The bridge became a cautionary tale for engineers and architects across the world. It was finished three years after the Golden Gate, but before it even opened, workers on site noticed something unusual, that the roadway would bend and move in light winds. That was because the, um, well, the aesthetic of design at the time was to make them look uh, slender and narrow, and uh, that also made them susceptible to the wind because that made them light. Because engineers on the Tacoma Narrows had decided to use plate girders instead of trusses to stiffen the bridge, the wind travelling across these girders caused the bridge to move in a wave-like motion. On the day of the collapse, the wind somehow caused the bridge to twist, which caused vortices over and under the roadway. The problem was that these vortices amplified the twist ever so slightly. When the deck of the bridge swung to the right, the vortices would push it back just a little bit faster. As the deck swung back into place, its momentum would swing it up to the left, where more vortices would be generated. Each time it swung left to right, it would go higher and higher. Kind of like what happens when you move your legs on a swing. And this kept happening, amplifying the movement. If you put a piece of paper up to your lips and blow on it, the paper begins to vibrate really quickly. It's called air elastic flutter, and that's basically what happened, just on a massive scale. And you can actually see videos of this happening on YouTube. 
including the moment the cables just couldn't hold the load anymore and the bridge collapsed. The Golden Gate didn't succumb to the same fate as the Tacoma Narrows because it had used trusses. Yes, under the deck or the roadway, that's exactly right. Now, uh, it, didn't, it didn't prevent the Golden Gate Bridge from uh, moving entirely. Uh, in fact, the uh, roadway was uh, in, in a strong wind, which is not a rare occurrence along the uh, Golden Gate Strait. The bro bridge's roadway was uh, blown sideways uh, quite a bit in a gale. Uh, it also undulated. It, it undulated uh, when the wind blew a certain way. And that's, that's what brought the Tacoma Narrows Bridge down, this undulation, the bending. So the Golden Gate Bridge itself wasn't the perfect design, but... In, in response to that, the Golden Gate was, uh, over time, stiffened. Uh, steel was added to that truss to make it stiffer. And uh, that pretty much solved the wind problem to a large extent. Back to the construction of the Golden Gate. Workers had just spun, compressed, and anchored the cables. And the construction of the deck could finally begin. From the cables at intervals, which depends on the design, it could be 30, 40 feet, you drop what are called suspenders. These are wire ropes. And if you go to the Golden Gate, you go up close, you can touch them, you can see uh, how big they are and how they, you can feel that they're pretty uh, tense and they don't move easily. Uh, and then those connect, hang down from the main cable and connect to the, uh, the deck, the steel truss structure that we've been talking about. And that's basically how that is hung, uh, how that is supported. It's, it's not unlike hanging clothes on a clothesline to, to take a domestic image. Yeah, that, that's really what it, what it is. In the clothesline example, the metal structure of your clothesline is the tower. The line itself is the cable, the pegs are the suspenders, and the clothes are the road deck. The road deck itself was built in small sections that were transported to where they needed to be by boat. I, and you take from the boat and then lift it to the position. And once you are at the correct elevation, you connect it to the previous already erected section. One of Strauss's biggest innovations while building the Golden Gate Bridge wasn't what you would expect it to be. At the time, health and safety wasn't really a priority. Where today, any injury on site is a big deal, the industry norm in the United States at the time was that one man would die during construction for every million dollars spent. Think about it. This was a $35 million project. Using this calculation, 35 workers were expected to die on site. Expected to die which is just crazy to think about. And Strauss agreed. He decided he wanted to beat those odds and spent a big chunk of the budget on health and safety. Workers wore glare-free goggles and used cream to help protect their hands from the effects of high winds. Strauss had hard hats specially designed for the project, which had to be worn at all times. There are even stories of Strauss putting his workers on special diets to help fight dizziness while constructing the towers. Then there's stories of Strauss's sauerkraut juice that helped cure workers who arrived on site after a heavy night's drinking. A different form of health and safety. He also had a $130,000 net installed under the bridge, which would catch any workers that fell. And over the course of construction, this net saved the lives of 19 men, who became known as the Halfway to Hell Club. Health and safety protocols were often flouted on other sites at the time. But Strauss made sure his workers complied with his rules at all times. Anything unnecessarily risky, and you'd be gone. As one worker put it, all a guy had to do was to stand out there on one foot, and he was fired. Strauss's safety standards kept the site fatality free until the last few months, just before the bridge opened. One worker was killed by a falling lifting device, and ten others were killed when their scaffolding collapsed, tore through the safety net, and fell into the bay below. But even with these fatalities, Strauss had shown how health and safety could dramatically reduce the number of deaths on a site. 200,000 pedestrians crossed the Golden Gate the day it was opened, and since then, more than 2.2 billion vehicles have crossed it. The bridge has been a massive success, and it was celebrated with another pedestrian day on its 50th anniversary. And so many people showed up to celebrate this uh, 50th anniversary 
that the bridge became overloaded. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it deflected noticeably. So the, the center of the bridge noticeably bent down and it could be seen uh, you know, from, from a distance. So when the uh, uh, 75th anniversary was approaching, they decided not to open it up to pedestrians because uh, it, it's a little too risky. Don't worry, Strauss and his engineers had factored things like this into their plan. The Golden Gate is flexible and definitely safe to travel across. It's also still being fine-tuned. They recently modified the railing of the bridge from the original design. To uh, in part save weight, but also in part to let the wind move through the bridge uh, a little more easily. And that's had some rough, rough spots too, because uh, in the way they've installed the slats, basically it's like a picket fence. So you can put the pickets facing the wind or cutting the wind. And they, the original ones were facing the wind. Uh, the new ones uh, cut the wind, or so they thought that would be great. But when you cut the wind, you're going to like an airplane wing, and an airplane wing wants to vibrate. <laughs> and there have been complaints about the sound that's emanating from the Golden Gate Bridge. So it's 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 never uh, it's it's a never-ending task to uh, you know <laughs> build a bridge and uh, uh, keep everybody satisfied who wants to cross it. This is audio from a video uploaded to Twitter by S.G. Brown of the sound that the Golden Gate makes today. Sounds Like Infrastructure is a collaboration between Ferrobial and Beleta Media. Our team includes Craig Lawless, Jose Garcia Guaita, Arancha Gulias, Manuel Sanchez Medina, and myself, Kevin Garcia King. Don't forget to leave a review on Apple Podcasts if you enjoyed the episode, or even better, share it with a friend. I'm Kevin Garcia King. I'm Craig Lawless. And this is Sounds Like Infrastructure.